Commission, regardless of whether or not people accuse Lance Armstrong of doing something, regardless of whether or not they're, they're questioning a relationship with a doctor, we have to look at the facts. We're sick and tired of these allegations, and we're going to do everything we can uh, to fight them. They're absolutely untrue. I've said it for seven years. I've said it for longer than seven years. I have never doped. If you consider my situation, a guy who comes back from arguably a, you know, a death sentence, why would I then enter into a sport and dope myself up and risk my life again? That's crazy. I would never do that. I, that that's, no. No way. As far as I'm concerned, this is really uh, going to be the end of the story. This is sort of my last public appearance on it, and there's nothing else I can do. I've never taken performance enhancing drugs. Look, how could that have happened? That was my point. You're not, it's not just simply you don't recall. Just I, How many times do I have to say it? I'm just trying to make sure your testimony is clear. Well, if it can't be any clearer than I've never taken drugs, then incidents like that could never have happened. Okay. How clear is that? Could you specifically respond specifically to Floyd's claim that you and Johan taught him how to dope? Other than saying it's not true? We have nothing to say. We have nothing to hide. He said he has nothing. He's got no proof. It's, it's his word versus ours. Well, I guess that would be hypocrisy, right? I never did it. I wouldn't think of doing it all the while doing it. Remember, it was on the Oprah Winfrey show that he said, finally, I did take performance-enhancing drugs for seven years. Ask secularists why they're not Christians, and you're likely to hear Christians are such hypocrites. Hypocrisy is a huge turnoff. Uh, maybe you're one who've pulled back from attending church because you perceive that there are people in the church that are just hypocrites. Do you hear about the woman who came to the pastor of a non-denominational Christian church, kind of like this one, and she said, would you uh, do a funeral for my dog? Can you bury my dog? And he says, nah, we, we, don't, we don't do memorial services for animals. But you might want to try the uh, Catholic priest down the street. She said, okay, uh, but can you give me a little advice? Uh, should I pay him $500 or $1,000? The pastor says, now wait just a minute. You didn't tell me your dog was a non-denominational Christian. <laughs> I mean, pastors are hypocrites. Remember the Reverend Ted Haggard? He was a pastor of one of the largest churches in the United States in Colorado Springs. This is 10 years ago. He was a consultant to the White House, president of the National Association of Evangelicals. He resigned for sexual immorality, deceit, and lying. He was real big in the run-up to the election in Colorado against homosexuality and gay marriage. Yet, he was involved in a drug-infused relationship with a homosexual male partner. And the final straw was when Mike Jones of Denver um, realized that the man that he was seeing was using a false name, and this was Ted Haggard. He said, I never really wanted to destroy their family. I didn't want to hurt the, the man, but I had to call out a hypocrite. Everybody loves to hate a hypocrite. And hypocrisy is not something that is just done by Christians. Uh, when I read The God Delusion, uh, Richard Dawkins, Dawkins is probably the leading atheist today in the world. And, uh, you know, I expected to see a lot of crazy arguments for why, you know, creationists are wrong, there's really no God. But what I was surprised about were all the misquotes. Now Dawkins goes crazy. He whines about it all the time of uh, creationist writers misquoting him. He just makes him so mad. That's what was, I mean, there were like dozens of misquotes where it would take like four or five words of a, a Christian sentence and leaves out you know, all the paragraphs, all the context, and makes it say something totally different than the writer's trying to say. So we can all be hypocrites. A lot of atheists will tell you, don't go to church 
because there are so many hypocrites there. Zig Ziglar uh, tried to invite his friend to church one Sunday, and his friend said, well, I'd love to go with you, but, uh, you know, the church is so full of hypocrites. Ziglar says, that's no problem. There's always room for one more. <laughs> Non-believers are right in saying there are a lot of hypocrites in church. Christians are hypocrites. I mean, we're called to be like Jesus Jesus says you're supposed to be perfect like your Father in heaven. So that's what we're supposed to achieve. None of us does that. I mean, Christians get jealous. Christians get angry. They lust. They lie. They eat too much. Christians are sinners. We're broken. But that doesn't take away anything about the truth of Christ. That's like saying... I won't go to this oncologist because he smokes. He's such a hypocrite. Well, his hypocrisy doesn't take away anything from the care he can give you. So let's agree that hypocrisy among Christians is a huge turnoff to non-believers. Can we all agree on that? When Christians make a pretense of having virtuous moral character they really don't have, Non-believers are turned off. Non-believers are looking for authenticity. So how can we become less hypocritical and more authentic? The Apostle John addresses this uh, whole subject in his letter, 1 John. The entire letter is really a statement, an answer from John of what is the real thing when it comes to following Christ. Who is really a Christian? And he synthesizes it all down to three things. The real thing in Christian faith is to believe Jesus, obey Jesus, and love people. I mean, I've said this so many times, I bet you could repeat it. Let's try that. A real thing in Christian faith is to believe Jesus, obey Jesus. Little lacking in confidence, but you're getting that. All right, so today I want to look at the second one, obedience. The real thing is to obey Jesus. A hypocrite claims to obey Jesus, but doesn't. They claim to be virtuous, but behind the scenes when no one is watching, they're anything but virtuous. So John addresses this, 1 John 2, 28. So take a Bible. There's one under the seat in front of you. Maybe you brought your own. You could use your phone. John gives some sage advice on how to avoid hypocrisy and to obey Jesus. Now, any passage we look at, you want to kind of look for key words. So usually they're the words that are used most often. So I counted them for you uh, nine times. Uh, he uses the, the phrase children of God. Ten times he uses the word sin. And seven times he uses the word right. Okay, so if we're talking about how to avoid hypocrisy and obey Jesus, it's going to have something to do with understanding that we're a child of God, something that we're going to have to deal with our sin somehow, and we're going to have to learn how to live right. Okay, something about that. All right, let's stand in honor of God's word. 1 John 2, 28 to 3, 10. Now, dear children, Continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who, keeps li who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Now we're going to have to grapple with what does that mean. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This is how we know. 
This is a phrase John uses throughout his book. This is how we know who the real thing is. Who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child. Nor is anyone who does not love their brother or sister. Lord Jesus, once again, would you be our teacher? You inspired John to write this. He was one of your disciples. Help us understand what it means. We don't want to be hypocrites, but we are. So help us know how to deal with this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, if I could take those 12 verses and boil them all down, I would use this phrase. Children of God do right to live up to their family name. How can we avoid hypocrisy? Uh, how can we do right and live up to our family name? Uh, John gives two pieces of advice. First one, remember you are a child of God. He uses that phrase nine times. 1 John 3, 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God and that is what we are. He says we are children of God. Then he pounds his fist against his other uh, hand and says, and that's what we are. If you've committed your life to Jesus Christ, you're a child of God. You're part of his family. One of the features of being a child of God is you begin to resemble God. Uh, our son Tad and his wife Diana had a baby last year, Addie. So when a baby's born, the first thing people begin to ask is, does she look more like Tad or Diana? You know, you look at the hair, the nose, the ears, the chin, the fingers. And then, of course, Grandpa walks in and says, I think she looks more like me. <laughs> you know, when a child grows up, they begin to take the mannerisms, the attitudes, the personalities of their mom or dad or both. As a member of God's family, you begin to become more like Christ. And in a family, you have privileges and responsibilities. In our family, privileges are shelter, we provide food, we provide clothing, we provide education, we provide love, and training. Responsibilities our kids have. They have to go to school. They get guidance from us, whether they want it or not. They get correction, they have to come to church, they have chores. Now John is telling the believers in the Roman province of Asia that as children of God they have privileges and responsibilities. What are their privileges? Well one he says, you are loved by God. Imagine if you went to Salt and Straw or Cold Stone and you got a waffle cone and the operator just took a little scoop of ice cream and put it down there. You had to kind of look to see if there was any in there. And then he took a little dab of uh, chocolate sauce, put it on it, then just a smidgen of whipped cream. When you go into God's ice cream shop, he fills that waffle cone with lush ice cream. He lathers it with chocolate sauce and he puts a mountain of whipped cream on it. Of course, you know, no trans fats or uh, cholesterol, nothing, none of that stuff. God lavishes his love on us. I mean... Uh, uh, Max Lucado says, if God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. If he had a wallet, your photo would be in it. God is crazy about you. Now, when you have a father that loves you that much and is that crazy about you, what happens? You want to become like him. You want to please him. Second a privilege is you are watched. Uh, Jesus says, not a hair will fall from your head without God knowing about it. Believe me, God is watching you. He's watching out for you. And people are watching you. I imagine when Prince William and Kate go out, maybe they get a little irritated that every place they go, people are taking pictures. They want to see them and talk to them. Uh, but really, it's a privilege that they're so famous and loved that people want, you know, to see them. 
Uh, when you claim to have given your life to Jesus Christ, to be a Christ follower, the world is watching to see if you're the real thing. It may not seem fair to you, but the world holds you to a higher standard. If a Christian, especially one who is uh, well-known, messes up, it becomes big news in the media. But if a non-Christian does the same thing, it's no big deal. Why? Because the Christian claims to follow Jesus. The non-Christian makes no such claim. So the Christian's held to a higher standard. I mean, imagine uh, this conversation. Sarah says to her friend, hey, I haven't seen you at Costco lately. Yeah, you know, I haven't been going there much lately because last time I was there, it was filled with hypocrites. What? Who, talk, who cares who goes to Costco? Nobody. But you hear that kind of statement all the time about the church. Ah, it's so full of hypocrites. Why? Because they hold Christians to a higher standard. You may not like it, but it's just the way it is. So you're being watched. You are held to a higher standard. Now, with privileges in God's family come some responsibilities. One is to do right. As a child of God, you want to act like God. You want to act like Jesus. Jesus says you are to be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. You are to become like Jesus. You are to do right. 1 John 2, 29, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. Chapter 3, verse 2, dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. As we seek to follow Christ, the goal is to become more and more like him. Year after year, become more like him in his forgiveness. You become more like him in his Love. You become more like him in his kindness. You become more like him in his self-control. And then John says, he doesn't know exactly how it's going to work, but when Christ comes again and we go to heaven, then we're going to be completely like him. We're going to be without sin. Wow. Chapter 3, verse 7. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as Jesus is righteous. Verse 10, this is how we know who's the real thing, who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child. Seven times John says the responsibility of a child of God is to do right. Let's suppose you grow up in a home and your parents have the rule that you're not allowed to hit your little sister over the head with a pan. <laughs> Sounds like a reasonable rule, right, Barbara? Barbara? I mean, your parents are smart. They know if you do that, there's going to be maybe a concussion, maybe a scar, or maybe a trip to the hospital. It's going to be a big, bad deal. Now, you may be so irritated with your little sister that you just can't stand it anymore and you hit her over the head with a pan. But I'll tell you, you're going to be guilty about that maybe the rest of your life. Because that's just... That's just not the good thing to do. So there's a rule, right? Makes sense. God has rules for his children. As his children, it is our responsibility to do our best to try to do right, live up to the family name. Peter puts it this way. As obedient children, do not be conformed to your former lusts, which were yours in your ignorance, but as him who called you is holy, be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. John uses another word when talking about our responsibilities. Verse 3 of chapter 3, all who have this hope in him purify, there's the word, themselves just as he is pure. So another responsibility is purify yourself. Jesus was totally without sin. He died for our sins, so we would not have to live in bondage to our sins anymore. Now, we don't want to crawl back into those very sins that he died to free us from, so we have to actively do something we purify ourselves verse 4 everyone who sins breaks the law in fact sin is lawlessness but you know that a he appeared so that we might so that he might take away our sins and in him is no sin no one who lives in him keeps on sinning no one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him now when john says no one who lives in him keeps on sinning 
No one continues to sin, uh, has either seen him or known him. And then he goes on in verse 8, says the same thing. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. Now, when he says that, he doesn't mean that the child of God will never sin. I mean, none of us is perfect. We all mess up. What he means is a child, the real thing in a child of God doesn't continually sin. He doesn't make a habit of it. When God convicts him that he's done something wrong, guilt moves him to confess it. He humbly confesses it. He's honest with God. He's transparent with other people and gets back to following God again. Transparency is the key to not being a hypocrite. You make no claim to being perfect. You don't claim to be high and holy and better than everyone else. You don't try to prevent, present yourself as being so good. You're open and honest with people about your faults. You don't try to hide your sins. Craig Groeschel is a pastor of one of the largest churches in the United States in Oklahoma City, 30,000 people. They have like several satellite churches around Oklahoma City called TV Church. Uh, Chris Quinn and I are going to hear him speak and Andy Stanley this Thursday in Seattle. So in his book, Soul Detox, he tells about a Sunday where he was talking about this subject of, you know, take off your mask. Don't try to put on a pretense of somebody you're not. Be honest with people. Be transparent. And so a guy went to a community group that night and he uh, did something he'd never done before. Choking back tears, he said, I've wanted to tell you guys this for a long time, but I've never been able to do it. But I got to tell you, I'm addicted to pornography. Now, that's hard for a guy to do. It's not so unusual. I mean, we, we estimate 38% of men in churches are addicted to pornography or into it at some level. But actually saying it is hard to do. A girl went to that community group that night, a new believer, never gone before, her first time, and she was so nervous. She said when she heard that guy make a confession, it took her breath away. She was just certain that everybody was going to pounce on him. But what happened next caused her to move in a new direction that would change her life forever. Instead of the group pouncing on him, one guy said, yeah, I was addicted to pornography for several years. God's help and people, I finally got out of it. And a girl said, you know, I was addicted to pornography in a low point in my life. Same thing for me. It took a lot of people around me. And they gathered around him. They prayed for him. They hugged him. And the unconditional love that she saw given to him caused her to take it a dare. Trembling with emotion, she said, I got pregnant when I was high school and the father of the baby skipped out on me. So I was left alone with a baby. No way that I could have money to raise him. So I took a job as an exotic dancer. Said, I'm not proud of it. I know it's wrong. But the money's good and pays the bills. But I feel like I'm stuck and I can't get out. And then a chain of miracles began to happen. One guy said, if, if you quit your job, I will help you cover your expenses. Another person did the same. Within 10 minutes, that group had pledged enough money to cover her for two months. Armed with that new confidence, she marched to the club the next day and told her manager she was done, not coming back. Then another member of the group asked a favor 
of a friend and got her an interview with his boss. She came in on Tuesday and the, boss, the manager liked her and she started to work on Wednesday. She was on a whole new path. Now, she could have confessed her sin to God and been forgiven, but by confessing to people, she got healed. Now this girl's launched a ministry to help other women out of the stripping industry. She was transparent about her life, and that helped her break free from the life she wanted to get rid of, get away from. The irony is that the more transparent we are, the more quick we are to humble ourselves and confess our sins, the more likely we are to get away from whatever sin has trapped us. Children of God do right to live up to the family name. You say, that's just it. I don't. I feel trapped and I can't get out and I keep blowing it again and again. I feel like the Apostle Paul when he wrote, although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. You ever felt that way? For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. I want to do the things I, the Bible tells me to do, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to to death. Maybe you feel like the Apostle Paul and you're a prisoner to sin. John has one more word of advice. His first word of advice was remember you are a child of God with its privileges and responsibilities. His second word of advice is in 228. And now, dear children, continue, there's the word, in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. Continue is the Greek word meno. It's the same word that uh, Jesus uses in his famous narrative in John 15. Uh, I am the vine, you are the branches. Remain in me and I will remain in you. If you remain in me, you'll bear much fruit. Without me, you can do nothing. So here's John's second word of advice. Continue in Jesus so you may be confident and unashamed at his coming. John says, you're right. You can't stop sinning. You can't escape whatever it is has you trapped. You don't have the strength or the willpower. You have to continue in Jesus. You have to remain in Jesus. You have to stay close to Jesus. You have to be humble and transparent and admit that you can have no victory over sin without him and his strength. That's why I say over and over again, please, Try to spend 15 minutes a day in God's word. Spend 15 minutes a day with Jesus. It's, it's a time to get your, your rudder set in the right direction. Don't march out into your day without this, without a, a time with Christ and be running your life on your own strength. A little bit of time in his word. Do a, maybe a couple questions. You, you get your mind set, a couple thoughts, and then you pray through your day and you tell him, I need to depend on you for everything I do today. Help me. You stay close to Jesus and depend on him. That's the gospel. The gospel is not just that we admit at one time that we have sinned and we need Christ's forgiveness come into our lives. Yes, it's that. But it's admitting that that goes on the rest of our lives. We're weak. We need his ongoing help moment by moment every day. Children of God do right to live up to their family name. But we're not perfect when we mess up, we humbly admit it. We're transparent. We're honest with people about who we are. We admit that we're hypocrites and we blow it. And then get back to depending on Jesus again. Lord Jesus, thank you for inspiring John and speaking to us about a subject that's pretty important. We don't want to be hypocrites. There's nobody here that wants to be a hypocrite. It's crummy. I don't know much about Lance Armstrong today, Lord, but I, I know he's better off now having come clean than to continuing being a hypocrite. It's a miserable existence. So maybe you want to 
say something like that to God right now. I want to give you a minute to pray. If you've never committed your life to Jesus, you could do it right now, or you feel like you need to commit your life to him again. Say, Jesus, I need you in my life. Come in, please. Be my Savior. If you say, I don't want to be a hypocrite, help me to be more transparent, authentic, honest with people, with you, quick and humble to confess, why don't you say that right now? I'll give you a minute. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you don't leave us alone. You give us your Holy Spirit to live in us and to transform us. And may we depend on him so we have a shot at becoming more like you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.